So we're going to start tonight by talking about decisions. That is what branching is all about in Python and in any language. When you're talking about branching, you are talking about the need to make a decision. And as humans, decisions come um, somewhat easy tests. We understand the English language, how to ask a question. That's all going to change tonight. What I do want to also introduce you to is where we really are. Week one and week two were introductions. They taught you about the basics of strings and types and variables. Um, and now we're moving into a little bit more complex areas. We're going to um, we're going to talk tonight about what an algorithm is, and um, you're solving a computational problem. You have been solving computational problems. So you have been writing algorithms. Those algorithms are about to get more complex. Um, all of this is important for this class because in week seven, you are going to hand in your game. And you're going to need all of this. You won't need to worry about uh, data storage or object oriented for your game. But you're going to have to know everything else. And you're going to be making a lot of decisions in that game. And we need to figure out how to do that. We have some new keywords. So we have, um, in this case, the order is 1. And the order matters here. These have to happen in an order. So if tells Python that you're about to ask it a question, and then the second through however many there are is elif. So if is always first, elif can be second. And now you're going to make, elif says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make another decision, but it's going to be related to the if. So and then the very last thing, if you need it, is an else. And basically, else is just that. If none of this other stuff evaluates to true, do what I tell you to do. So those are the three new keywords that we're really going to get this week. And that's their order. So now we have some relational operators. Relational operators return one of two variables, true or false. And we're going to talk about those in a little bit. But this is just a rundown of what those new operators are. Now remember, starting in week one, I said uh, we know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. That is called an assignment. Now we have two equal signs together. And that is used when you're asking a question. What you're saying is, is what's on my left-hand side equivalent to what's on my right-hand side. So just like a variable is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign, you will have a left hand before the operator, the operator, and then something on the right side. So you have to understand that that's what the question is going to entail. So we have a double equal sign. We have bang equal. And you can assume that bang is not, N-O-T. So it means the opposite. So it's not equivalent to. We have less than. We have less than or equal to, greater than or greater than or equal to. So those are the basic Boolean operators that we're going to be using throughout this class. So um, now we have some special operators. And, and they're really for creating compound statements, compound questions. We have and. And OK, so we have and. Um, so yeah, and and and. So the left hand of the and and the right hand of the and both have to be true for it to be true. Or, and we'll explain this more later, it's a relational statement um, that must be true for the compound statement to be true. So and is for the entire statement, or is for one piece of the statement, and not is the opposite of the operand. 
So you would say not and or not or. And this is all about getting true or false. Computers are stupid. I said this on week one. I think I might have said it last week. But if I didn't, I'm about to say it again. Computers are stupid. They are like a light switch. You turn them on and you turn them off. Not the dimmer switch you have in your dining room, but it's got an on and it's got an off. And that's it. That's the only thing that a computer has to make a decision. And we call those two states true and false because that's what they are. There's, there's just two states in a computer, on or off, or true and false. So those are the two possible outcomes from any question you can ask Python. That means that we have to learn how to ask Python the right way so that we get what we expect, either a true or a false. And that is also where I see students, when they get to week three, having the biggest problem. It's not that they don't understand what they're supposed to do. It's they have trouble figuring out how to ask that question. And if you always remember that you've only got two answers, true and false, you work back from there, you can usually get, with a little bit of practice, what the actual statement or expression is going to be when it comes to the question you want to ask. So the other thing we're going to start talking about this week is scope. We talked a little bit about it before, but we have to begin to understand scope now. We can't wait until week five. We can't wait until week seven. We have to understand week six scope now because scope becomes a big and important part of how we think about what we're doing. So there are three basic scopes in Python. Global scope and local scope. Everything we've done so far is in the global scope. Everything. We're introducing the concept this week of a local scope. And the local scope means that that code only exists in a certain place, whether it be inside of a function. In our case, it's going to be inside an else, uh, an if, an elif, or an else. And we'll know it because it's indented, but it defines where the code will function. It also defines where things like variables exist. You can define a variable inside the local scope, and it is not available to the global scope. But the opposite is not true. If you define it in the global scope, it will always be available in the local scope. And so this is a concept to think about, but also to start getting in your brain, because we're going to use it when we do looping. We're going to use it when we do functions. We're going to use it when we do object-oriented. Um, all of, So everything scope now becomes something to keep in the back of your mind and start thinking about. So, syntax formatting and scope. Let's talk for a second. So here I have a Python script. User age, int, input, so I'm expecting someone to input an integer. And this is challenge 3.2.2, by the way. Um, I'm going to ask a question. If user age is less than 18, print 18 or less, else print over 18. Now, you'll notice the if statement. Let, let's talk about a little bit of syntax here. Let me hit the, there we go. So first of all, I'm telling you what's in the global scope and what's in the local scope. The global scope is anything that is lined up on the left-hand side. That's the best way I can put it. It is not indented. There's no spaces, anything like that. It's what we've been doing. You start at zero and at the zero column in your console, and then you just start typing away. That doesn't work with, with local scope. So everything in the light blue is global scope, just like we've done. So the if statement itself is in the global scope. However, you will see that there are two print statements. The, both of the print statements are in the local scope, but different local scopes. So there is a local scope under the if, 
There has to be a local scope or else Python's going to give you a syntax error. And there's a local scope under the else. And what that means is, assuming my if user age is less than 18, evaluates to true, then I will print 18 or less. And then the program ends. It doesn't care about the else at that point. It doesn't care about the print over 18. Assuming that user age is greater than or 18, it will not do anything with print less than or it will not do anything with that local scope under that if statement because if evaluated to false. And then else it will then do what's in the local scope for the else. I hope I haven't given anyone a headache yet. Okay, so let's talk about syntax. Um, if and else, tell Python it is time to make a decision. And there is an order, if always has to come first. So what I've told is, okay, Python, you're going to make two decisions, well, really one decision, and there's, go there's a relationship between if and else. So, and that relationship is called mutual exclusivity, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute. Then I have the statement that is the question. The user age less than 18 is a question that I am asking Python. And really, it comes out better as a statement. What I'm saying is a statement of user age is less than 18, true or false. And if you think about this as like the true or false test I had in elementary school, and probably everyone did, you read a statement and a statement is true, or the statement is false. This is what we're doing here, okay? This is a true-false test for Python. And then there's this colon. The colon may become the bane of your existence. Always check for the colon, and I will show you what happens when you don't have a colon. Um, so the colon is basically like a question mark when we're writing English. It says, this is the end of the statement, now do your evaluation Python. And that's with if, else, and including elif. Okay, those colons have to be there or you simply, it just, you won't, you'll get a syntax error. Um, rule number one, it's only in the local scope if it's indented. And I should have put a second rule that says, um, what was I just thinking? I'm sorry. I'll have to figure out my second rule in a minute. Um, and the, the other rule that's on here, a statement is a variable followed by a Boolean operator followed by a variable or value. So we see that with user age. User age is, var blah, user age is a variable. We know it's a variable because on the previous line from the if statement, it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And if we look at the if statement, I then have a Boolean operator. In this case, it's the less than sign. And then I have a value. Now, that could also have been another variable. But this is the basic format of a, of a, um, of the, the if decision to make, sorry, the if statement to make a decision. Okay. So, Again, computers aren't smart, neither are programming languages. I've never worked with a programming language that was smarter than, than you know, Python when it comes to branching. All of the computers are, same, are the same, unless you get into things like quantum computing, because we are stuck with the light switch. The light switch has been around. The first computers were, I think, in the late 1890s. They were manual but they were still Boolean systems. So if I'm looking at a question, am I young? If I type that into Python, it'll be a whole string of syntax errors because Python is like, what in the world are you asking me? Because Python doesn't speak English, so we have to learn to speak Python. How I ask a question, it's really a true-false test. What I ask, am I young? What Python says is, huh. 
So how do I ask this question in Python? Well, I really have to make it more definitive. Okay? Python doesn't understand what young is. It doesn't understand what old is. So we have to give a very concrete definition to what we mean by young. So in my test, in my true-false test, what I am going to do is I'm going to define, using the number 18, what young is. So if I am less than or equal to 18, I am young. Otherwise, I'm just old. So it's the true-false. User age less than or equal to 18 will evaluate to true or evaluate to false depending on what the user age is, and that's dependent on the person. So if I have user age of 90, well, I'm not considered young by this test. If I have user age of 16, I am considered young. So then I have my print statement. Again, it's in the local scope. You will notice that it is indented from the if. It will, this print statement will only happen assuming that the if statement above it, user age less than or 18, is true. And else basically says, okay, the if statement wasn't true, so instead do this. Else and if are related. So else will never, the, the, the local scope code underneath else is never called if the previous if statement is true. Everything else before that else has to evaluate to false for the stuff in the code block to happen Then the local scope of else. By the way, I haven't stopped for a second to see if anybody's asking questions. Yes. Okay, so... <laughs> I'm probably older, Laura, AJ. Okay, so whoops, let me get my little bit emoji out of there. Go to the next slide. So we're gonna we're gonna do a little bit of flow charting with this because I think it makes it easier to understand if we pull back from the language and look at it in a language agnostic fashion. By the way, you're gonna have to do flow charts this week. Float charts are really fun, but you have to get the symbols right. Okay, the symbols are very, very important. And, and there's a free tool out there called Lucid Chart, which will have all the symbols, and you can like download it to a PDF and turn it in. So what do we have here? Well, we have Professor Lisa sitting at her computer, and this is the flow chart for the code we were just looking at. I have my start. I'm going to have my user put in their user age. I'm going to make a decision. The decision is always a diamond because there's usually two things coming off that decision. What happens if it evaluates to true and what happens if it evaluates to false? Um, and then we end up going to the end. So this is why it's called branching. You will see branches coming off that diamond and that's what we see here. We see two branches. Now, can there be more than two branches? Mm, probably, but most people, um, well, I'll show you later, but basically um, what you're doing is you're saying if this, and then you break it. If you've got a really complex statement, you break it down into if, elif, and else tracks. So here, Professor Lisa is entering 21. That's my input. I'm going to then say 21 is user age. So user age is less than or equal to 18. That is false. And so what we have here is you will see the whole true side from that diamond just disappeared because that's what Python does. Okay? It doesn't unwrite your code, but it ignores it. It's like that code doesn't exist. And by the way, this is what an else looks like in a flowchart. When you see the false to the right, 
that's just saying that somebody has an else statement after that if, or that's what they're expecting. So now let's do this again, okay? I'm Professor Lisa. Well, first of all, let's write all the code back up there. I am going to put in 10 for my user age. 10 is less than or equal to 18. So it evaluates to true, and I'm going to print out 18 or less and end the program. So that's kind of what you see when you're dealing with branching in a language agnostic fashion. So one more decision maker. So we have that, that, that other keyword, elif, and now we're going to talk about what to do with it. So what I ask, am I middle-aged? And Python again looks at me like I have three heads. User age, I'm going to use user age again, and it's going to be the input. And then I'm going to have if user age is less than or equal to 18, well, we've seen this already, print 18 or less. Elif, user age is less than or equal to 50, then we're going to print in the middle. Otherwise, we're going to print nope, you're old. So that, that's how we now incorporate. Now, you have to understand that these are mutually exclusive. What does mutual, mutual exclusivity mean? Mutual exclusivity, or being mutually exclusive, means that if one thing happens, the next thing won't. And how we translate that into decision making in Python is an if is mutually exclusive from its elif and else. An elif is mutually exclusive from an if statement and an else. And an else is mutually exclusive than anything above it. And all that means is when user age is less than or 18, evaluates to true, I will say print 18 or less, and then it's like the rest of the code doesn't exist to Python. Just like in that previous uh, flowchart where the lines just kind of went away, excuse me, same thing here. Um, we just have lots more lines. Okay, so here's the middle age flowchart. I'm going to have a user age. Now, this is going to be a little more complex. If age is less than or equal to 18, and it's true, then I'm going to print less than 18 and be done. Otherwise, I'm going to a second question. And that other question is, is it less than or equal to 50? And if it is, then I'm going to print middle age. If it's not, then I'm just going to print your old, and I'm going to end. So this is what it looks like to have um, to have an ELIF statement. And so when you see here that we're using the value 10 and all of that code just kind of went away, all of those lines went away, it's because of mutual exclusivity. It's because Python will not consider any, any ELIF or ELSE statements after this IF because they don't exist, because the if evaluated to true. So, and that was with the value 10. So here's our, all our code back. Let's do 21. 21 is not less than or 18, but it is less than 50. So uh, all of the other stuff goes away. This eva the elif evaluates to true. So I'm going to print in the middle. So now I've executed the first statement, but it was false. So then I went to the ELIF statement, and the ELIF statement was true, and you'll notice that the ELSE went away. So now all my code is back, and I'm going to put in 60. So 60 is not less than or 18. 60 is not less than or equal to 50, which means it evaluates to false. And I'm going to say, nope, you're old. And by the way, this on a flowchart is what an else looks like. You'll notice there's no diamond with an else. An else is really everything else was false, so do me instead. And so it's going to print, nope, you're old. So this is just a visual cue to let you know when Python is ex 
when, when you should expect Python to actually execute your code. Because there might be large swaths of code that aren't executed all the time because they're inside of a branch. Okay, um, let's do a little code. Yes. It can end on an elif. It can end on an else. It can end on an if. The only thing that's required for a branch is the if keyword. Assuming there are other related questions to ask, like, like we saw with, you know, am I old or am I middle-aged, then you're going to need more. That's when you have to understand the order, but it can end even from an if. You can say, if this, do that, and then not worry about it anymore, and go on to the next part of your code. So... Uh, let's do that. Uh, 3.2.2 plus. Okay. So this is what we just saw. And we have user age, which is going to be an input. And then we have elif and else. Now, I'm going to do a few things just to show you what the error, errors will be. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of that colon. So first of all, in PyCharm, you get the little squiggly stuff. And hold on. This is the plus one. This is it. OK. So if I attempt to run this, I get and an error that actually means something because it's really pointing this time to the right place in the code. So what it's telling you is there's an invalid syntax. When you see that at the end of an if statement, the probability is you've forgotten a colon. Now, the next error that you might see is what happens when you don't bother to indent something after an if, an elif, or an else. They all behave the same way. And you do this, you're going to get an indentation error, expected an indented block. What that's telling you is that this is not positioned to be in the local scope. You are trying to make it global scope, but the only thing you can do on the line after an if statement is have something indented to run. You can't have an if statement out there without any statements under it to run. The same with an elif. You will find the exact same thing. So you have to remember to indent. Now, if I did this and then I went you will also now see a bunch of red squigglies. What happened was, maybe I wanted print ha 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 to be part of the if's local scope. Maybe I didn't want it to be. But what I have done by not indenting this print is to make everything else in error. Python doesn't know what to do because you're supposed to start with an if. By having line 12 be left justified, I have told Python, any previous if statement, don't worry about it, it's done. When you get to me, just keep going. That's all fine and good, unless you have this order of decisions, the if, elif, and else. An elif cannot exist without an else, without an if. And an else cannot exist without an if. So if I try and run this, then we get syntax error, elif user age is 50. Now this is one of those times when you're going to sit there and look at this elif statement and say, but that looks right to me. It is right. But this is when you have to start looking backwards to figure out where the true issue is. And in this case, the true issue is that I put this print statement here. Maybe it didn't belong here. Maybe it belonged somewhere else. At a minimum, I have to indent it. For right now, I'm just going to take it out. 
So I am going to run this through the debugger just once so we can see what's happening. So on the console, it's waiting for me to put in my age, and I'm going to say 42. And here I have my variables. I'm going to step over. I have user age is 42. And the nice thing about PyCharm is I can go, where is it? I'm lying right now. There's 42. Oh. There's a way to mouse over where it will tell you what it evaluates to. Maybe it's that. That's what it is. So if you hold your mouse over the Boolean operator, PyCharm will tell you what it evaluates to. So in this case, it's going to evaluate to true. And so I'm going to step over, which actually puts me on line 13. I'm going to step over. And you will notice that it did not hit line 14 or 15 because I had hit, uh, I, it evaluated to true. So that's how you read through these, and those are some of the errors you are likely to encounter. Whoops. Where is it? There it is. Okay. The debugger is my favorite tool in any IDE, so I tend to use it. Um, the green arrow is just run. So when you use the green arrow, like this, oops, you will see that it, it's still going to ask me the same question. I'm going to put in 42, and then it's just going to run. It won't stop anywhere. And that's fine. A lot of people like to use that. I find it important for my own learning and my own coding because when, when you're programming as a professional, you run into some complex situations. And sometimes it's good in a running program to be able to see what it is you've done. Um, I'll give you an example. We have a couple of internal products at my company, and I am the stucky for one of them. It doesn't change often. It's on really old hardware and software, and I'm the one who gets to, to maintain it or make changes to it in the off chance that there will need to be. So this week it's been a need to be. And part of it is written in PHP, part of it is written in C and C++, part of it, it has it got some SQL stuff going on, and all that's great, but there's no debugger. The software is old enough where they don't make an IDE for it anymore. So instead of being able to have a replicated running system, and potentially an IDE, so like PyCharm, I could run through it, step through it, look at the complex stuff, figure out where all the relationships are. I have to do it by hand, and it's not always fun. So um, it's important to understand what a debugger is in my mind and how useful it is. And I remind myself whenever I have to go down this particular path, and um, fix this very old piece of software. Oops, there it is. Can you run it on a VM? Yes, I am running it on a VM. You mean this, the, I, I, AJ, I assume you're talking about the, the code I was writing. Yes, I, it is running on a VM. And the VM is a relatively new VM. But the operating system is very old. And um, therefore, I mean, it's been end of life for a long time. So it does run, a, it is running on a VM. It's just the software that we're using is really, really old. Um, so yeah. Anyway, thanks for asking. Now we're going to talk about Boolean operators. We just talked about how to make a decision with if, elif, and else. Now we're going to look at these things called Boolean operators. Now Boolean operators allow you to write very complex statements. Um, I rarely write code that, that is asking a single question at a time. Oftentimes I have to 
basically have different questions and add them all up, add the answers up, because there is a way to add the answers from a Boolean expression and figure out what the total answer is. So it's kind of like you're adding them all together. So in this case, we have and and or. Now, Zybox has a really good table. And when you're talking about ands and ors and nots, it can sound like you're babbling. This is one of those places where if you're talking to other programmers about Boolean operators, non-programmers will walk by and know that you've lost your mind. So we have, we're talking about the two Boolean operators, and and or, right now. What an and does says every question you ask before the colon, because I know you're going to ask multiple ones, has to evaluate to true for the entire statement to be true. If only one of the questions you ask in this string um, is false, the whole thing is false. That's just it. There's no more opportunity. All, of them have, all that has to happen is one of them to be false. Um, the, so true and true, So as long as everything in the if statement is true, the whole if statement will come out true. If only one thing in the if statement is false, the whole statement comes out false when you're using an and. Now, the opposite happens when you're using an or. With an or, any, if any one of the questions you're asking is true, the whole thing is true. So that's the difference between and and or, and it's important to learn them. Um, so here we're going to talk about between. Why are we talking about between? Because maybe it's going to be like a lab that you have to do. So between basically is a compound statement, compound set of questions. So I have age equal 20. I'm going to say if age is greater than 0 and age is less than 4, then you're going to print, oh, they don't go to school. If age is greater than or equal to 4 and age is less than 9, then they're in elementary school and so on. You guys can read the rest of the code. Now, when you're looking for things that are between two potential outcomes, usually numbers, it is always done with an and. You start with, um, to make it neat, you want to start with the lower order number and then end with the higher order. But it's not just that question. It's not just age greater than zero and age less than four. There's a relationship between the if, elif, elif, elif statements. So you'll notice that when I'm asking for if something is between zero and three, because that's what you're going to ask here, you're saying is 20 between zero and three. And why is it three and not, sorry, one and three? Why is it three and not four? Well, because it's a less than sign. It's not a less than or equal sign. So if I look and I say, is 20 greater than zero? Yes, that's true. So we got one thing that's true. And then age is less than four. Well, 20 is not less than four. So because it's an and, and 20 is not less than 4, so it's false, it will not do what's in the local scope of that if statement and print no school. And so you go through the rest of the statements and you check for age of 20. So there's no, there's no mystery here. Age is the variable we're checking for. It's going to have a value. Right now it's 20. You know, it might have an input statement afterwards. You always want to make sure that your betweens don't overlap. So the if statement has less than, age less than four before the colon. The elif statement has age greater than or equal to four. So I've done two things there. I've made sure that I'm not overlapping my betweens, and I've made sure to include four because I say greater than or equal to four. So a lot of students have problems um, when it comes to the concept of two things are between each other, and a lot of times 
um, problem statements use the word between. Um, okay, we're going to go over a bit tonight. So complex questions. Given the number 223, find the number of 100s and 10s. Output plural if more than one and output singular if zero. And if you're saying, gee, that sounds kind of like a lab that I might have to do, this is kind of like a lab that you have to do. It's just a very shortened and abbreviated version. So I've just got a number that's 223. Don't ask me why I put 223. So if I want to get the hundreds, the first thing I have to realize is this is not division. This is using the floor operator. And the floor operator is two backslashes or slashes. I can never remember. But there's two of them. And what that does is it gives me basically a whole number as a remainder. So in this case, hundreds would be two. And then I'm going to calculate how much is left. And then I'm going to set number to that. And then I'm going to have that number floored by 10, which should give me two. Excuse me. And I have, if hundreds is zero, print no hundreds. L if hundreds is greater than one, print number of hundreds is, else print there aren't any hundreds. So this is very simple, similar to a lab. And I think I have the flow chart here. Oh, here's all the other stuff. Read hundreds is equal to zero, true or false. Hundreds is greater than one, true or false. None of the if L is returned to true. Okay. So, and here's the remainder. This is the continued. And here's what we do for the tens. Okay. If tens is zero, then there are no, whoops, tens. My bad. I'll have to fix that. Okay. So, here's just the visual tool to do the same thing. So, and this is going to be much more complex flowchart because we have lots of stuff going on. So I'm going to set hundreds is equal to num floor 100. And then I'm going to do the same. I'm going to calculate how many tens there are. And then I'm going to do the same for tens. So now I have a question. If hundreds is zero, then I'm going to output no hundreds. Otherwise, I'm going to check to see if hundreds is one. If it's true, I'm going to output the number of hundreds. If not, I'm going to output 100. So you'll see there's an order here as well. I check for zero. Are there any of them? Then I check for something greater than one. Because that gives me everything in the middle. And then I check for, and then I let the else do the if it's only one. So there's a reason why I made those conditional statements, those branches, that way. So now, irregardless of what just happened with those if statements, I'm going to have another set of if, elif, and else statements that talk about the tens. So if, if tens is zero is true, then I'm going to output no tens. If tens is greater than one, I'm going to output number of tens is, and then otherwise I'm just going to output there's, that there's one ten. And then we're done with the program. So you'll see how these things can get more complex pretty quick. But I wanted you to understand, hopefully with this, um, the visual tool here about the ordering of the if, elif, and else statements and understanding what happens when you have multiples. Um, so we're just going to follow the numbers here. So we have hundreds equal to, num equal 23, tens equal to. So then what's going to happen is all of the other code that doesn't need to work is going away. And I'm going to print output of hundreds is 2, 
and then because tens is greater than one, I'm going to put output number of tens is, and then I'm done. So now the number is 42. There are zero hundreds, the number is 42, so tens is four. So if I go now and I look at what Python sees, given that information, Python sees only this. So I have if hundreds is zero, which is true, so I'm going to output no hundreds. If tens is zero, which is false, because there are four tens, then I'm going to check L if tens is greater than one. It is, so I'm going to output the number of tens is four, and I'm going to be done. So, what time is it? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that, AJ. I always get those things backwards. So those are forward slashes. I, I will try and remember the forward slashes fall forward. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go through the labs, and then we can you can ask any questions. We can do some programming, anything that kind of helps. But I just want to get through the labs. So, lab 3.13, we're going to input an integer, we're going to input a second integer, we're going to input a third integer, and now we're going to find out what's the largest. So, if num1 is less than num2, and, this is where we're using that conditional, the, the Boolean operator, num1 is less than or equal to num3, then num1 has to be the smallest number. If that is false, then I'm going to fall down to another question, and it's going to say, is num2 less than num1, and is num2 less than or equal to num3? If so, num2 is the smallest number. Otherwise, it's num3. So this is, you're just looking for the smallest number. And this is how it would be in a flowchart. And also, I don't think I have, the, ah, I do have the pseudocode. This week you're also learning about pseudocode. And while I prefer flowcharts to pseudocode, because the labs start to become increasingly more complex, I, I'm going to be providing pseudocode rather than flowcharts. This week I provide both. So in this case, you have three inputs. And it's the same thing as on the chart. I have if, elif, and else. Um, first is less than or equal to second, and first is less than or equal to third, then output first. So this is just what the pseudocode looks like. It's doing exactly the same thing as the flowchart, but it is more code-like, even though pseudocode is still language agnostic, which means you can use it on any language. It's really talking about the logical flow of steps, just like a flowchart is, but it's doing it more like a script. So, lab 3.12 stumps a lot of students. It is all about figuring out how to deal with not just, so, so here are the issues you're going to have to deal with. You have to double check that the month they put in is a valid month because maybe your teacher is going to put in XXX or Zybooks is going to put in XXX for the month. And if you're not checking to see if that's invalid, then it's a problem. Um, you also have to make sure the day is not only valid, a valid day, so it's not minus 10 and it's not 62. Um, but also where it falls. What season does that day make that month? Some of them are easy. Some of them aren't. They fall between. They fall in the middle of a month. So this is the beginnings of how you deal with that kind of complexity because that's what this is. It's a very, very simple reading program. But it is very complex. It will be the most complex thing you have written so far until you get to the next lab. Um, so 
what we have here is somebody's going to put in a month, somebody's going to put in a day. And actually, I think I'm just going to go to the pseudocode because this gives a better idea of what you have to write. Somebody's going to put in a month and somebody's going to put in a day. And here is the logic of how you have to set up this very set of, this is a complex set of decisions. This is a big algorithm, okay? So month has to equal one of the months. So you, what you will see here is I have an if and an elif statement for every month. So that's organization tip number one. Start with every, the first if starts at January, and then everything else is about a month. So it's January, it's February, it's March. The second thing you will see here, so this is the month, I'm going to use a Boolean operator, and. So it has to be the month, and the day has to be greater than zero, and the day has to be less than or equal to 31, which says January has 1 through 31 days. And if so, I'm going to output winter. Nah, it was good. Kind of boring. February will always be winter if it meets this criteria. Don't worry about leap days. Just go to 29 on this. Now I have March, and March is split between winter and spring. So I'm going to say if the month is March, perfect. And then I'm going to do an inner branch. So I'm going to say the outer branch is check for the month. Always check for the month first. If the day is greater than zero and the day is less than or equal to 19 because the first through the 19th is still winter in March, then I'm going to output winter. If the day is greater than 19 and less than or equal to 31, I'm going to output spring. Now here's something important. Else, output invalid. So I'm going to say, wait a minute, you put in 42 for the day and there are no, not 42 days in March. And this is the way you will continue. Every time you have a month, that is split, you're going to have this inner if, elif, and else statement to determine what to do with the days. So this is what you want to refer back to when it comes to this. If you're in my class and have any questions, the, this is where stuff gets harder. I am always happy for you to take a screen capture of your code or send me your code and any error messages you're getting from Zybooks. And I will do my best to lead you in the right direction of what you should or should not do. So now we get even more complex with 3.13. And this is, again, why I stopped doing flowcharts, because they're just unmanageable. So we're going to go to the pseudocode. So this is where we're going to use that floor operator, because we want to know how many dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies are in an amount. So I'm going to input a value, but then I have to check that the value is positive. So it's got to be greater than zero or equal to zero. It could be zero. Um, if they input a valid, an invalid number, let's say they input minus five, you need to output no change. And that is one of the things that Zybooks will do. It's going to give you in in um, intentionally bad data that shouldn't fit in your problem. Sorry, I just need a little water. Now, the first thing we have to do doesn't have anything to do with branching. It's all setting up for the branching problem. What we're going to do is we're going to find the number of dollars, the number of quarters, the number of dimes, nickels, and pennies, and we're going to do that using the floor operator, which is two forward slashes. Thank you very much, AJ, because they're falling forward. Um, and we're going to find the total number of dollars. Now, some students try the modula operator. That doesn't work here. You need to use the floor operator. Um, and we're going to do that 
for each of the monetary types from dollars to pennies. Then we get into the if statement and that if statement basically says if you have no, if num dollars is greater than zero, output num dollars. Otherwise, if it's one, output dollar, else output dollars. So you're having, again, an if statement, and then you're going to do something. In this case, we're going to output. And then you have a series of if, else statements inside the if statement. So they're just nested. And you can do that. You can make, you can nest as many if statements as you want, as deep as you want. And then you go through and you do the same thing for each of the types. Now, one thing to note is when you are doing the calculations, pretty much follow what I've got here. This is the right way to do those calculations. And if you don't do the calculations correct, the rest of this code will never be correct. You've got to get those calculations right. So do it this way especially with the calculations, and your if, elif, else statements should not be as frustrating. Okay, excuse me. So that was it. Now, um, yes. Can you see zero less than input day less than 31? Yes, you can. I tend to not, I'm an old, I'm old school. I tend to not use that um, that particular syntactical formatting just because to me it doesn't read as clearly as um, doing the between. When I look at a between, I think, you know, this evaluates and this evaluates. So, but, excuse me, I apologize. Um, what you are talking about, Will, is in fact very valid code as long as you do it right. Um, it's, it, there's flavor and function in programming. Um, function is, does it work properly? Is it doing everything that it should do in the most efficient manner possible? Flavor is, do you capitalize your variables or keep them lowercase? And in this case, um, Yes, so, um, so what I was talking about was flavor and function. So whether or not you do it as two individual statements or you do the more shorthand method is up to you. They both behave the same when Python is running them. Um, the statements are formatted like that. That's just because the way people use them. Um, between is fairly common, and for me when teaching, using that method of between makes it very, very clear what's happening. I don't have to let, tell them there is an implied and or an implied or. I can, it shows it right there. I've got two different statements, and they have to be both true for that question to evaluate to true. So that's one of the reasons I do it, and because it's just more readable to me. Um, I don't like to read through code that's got a lot of shorthand in it. Um, Efficiency-wise, it behaves exactly the same. Python doesn't care. So does anybody else have any questions? And would you like to go over some more code? Any code that you have questions on? By the way, it's OK to open your mics. Going once, going twice. Okay, we will call it for tonight. Um, as always, if you're in my class, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm going to uh, hopefully have this up tonight. So thank you everybody for coming and I hope that you guys have a wonderful weekend.